<laughs> There's a big difference between having conversation face to face and having conversation through social media. We know that when you have face to face conversations, you look someone in the eye, you listen to their voice, you interpret body language, you might even touch them, even in a professional capacity. These things are very important for establishing empathy, for understanding how someone else is thinking, what they might be feeling. And yet they are not available on Facebook. So on Facebook, all you have to go on are words or static pictures. So you're not interacting with the person. And if you're not therefore rehearsing that skill, then you're not going to be any good at it, like most things in life. There is a link, it seems, between autistic spectrum disorders, that's condition where people have problems with picking up and empathising in others, and screen activities. For example, it's been shown that um, you can record abnormal brain waves um, in an autistic person where they don't recognise faces as anything special or different from objects. So a table and a face will get the same response, whereas in ordinary people, the face will get a much bigger response. It's now been shown that people with heavy internet use have brain patterns, responses, similar to those people with autistic spectrum disorders. There's increasing work coming out now as well, showing there may be a link between um, screen experiences and then the development of autism. That's not to say it causes it, but there does seem to be a relationship that needs to be explored further. For example, autistic people are most comfortable in the cyber world and that I would suggest is because the playing field is now level. No one is using all those things that they find so hard. Yes, I think also that the perception of the self is changing. What's very interesting is only two days ago in the UK this new word has been more popular than any other, selfie. And a selfie is a picture of yourself that you take of yourself and it shows the narcissism, that is to say the fact that you are using as a reference point what you're doing all the time, what you think and what you feel and you no longer have friends, instead you have an audience because this audience must be entertained and amused, you're telling the audience everything all the time. The problem is the audience might not like what they're seeing, they might have their thumbs up or their thumbs down, and that will lower your self-esteem because you're not so confident anymore. So what we're seeing now, and there's science papers on this, is an increase in narcissism and an increase in low self-esteem, which is a rather sad um, combination to have. It seems that the crucial issue is if you have friends in the real world, then Facebook and so on is just fine. It's when the friends that you have are people you've never really met before. They are indeed an audience that give you their comments all the time online. Yeah, I think there's evidence coming out now on various aspects of video gaming. First is a shorter attention span. Um, secondly, in certain cases it can be addictive because it's actually tapping in to the same brain processes, that is the release of dopamine, that underlies addiction and reward. It might also be that in certain cases people are becoming uh, more aggressive as well. So there's aggression, addiction and short attention span, all of which we need to think about when we think about how many hours a child will spend video gaming each day. It comes down because this is a very sensitive issue. People might feel their personal lives are being attacked or they're being criticised as parents. It's very important that we have evidence to support these ideas. Now in science there's never a single experiment that everyone suddenly agrees in that solves all the answers. What you have is lots of different experiments tackling different aspects, looking at different things and of course it's not perfect, of course it's controversial, of course you need more. That's what science is. You never have everyone agreeing all at once. Um, and there is sufficient body now of data suggesting that there are issues here that we need to look at. And if people want to, they can look at my website, www.susangreenfield.com, because, because of this issue, I've put about 500 papers on there as a reading list that if people want to look at it, I suggest let them make up their own minds and think about it, but above all, discuss where we want to go with this. What's very interesting from the neuroscience point of view is if you look at the development of the brain, you can see that in the very young brain, or actually into teenage years, the frontal part of the brain isn't as developed as in the adult once they're into their 20s. Interestingly enough, there's also other conditions where that frontal part of the brain isn't fully operational. Very different things. One is obesity and the other is schizophrenia. The other is recklessness and gambling. And there's often a link. For example, it's been shown that people who are obese are more reckless in gambling tasks. And I think what we're looking at here, the common factor with this underfunctioning frontal part of the brain, is that the thrill of the moment is dominating over the consequences. And we know that when we're in an exciting or aroused situation, 
this transmitter dopamine is released, which actually dampens down that frontal part of the brain. So it's something we all do from time to time, but it's a very interesting association. One can think of different brain states whereby sometimes, as for schizophrenics and children and obese and reckless people, then the thrill of the moment is what counts. Yes, I concluded by saying there's two possible options. Um, if you look at where we're going, you could look at people who have um, a high IQ, say they're very good at information processing, they can multitask, um, they are rather agile in sensory motor coordination, but they are greater risk takers, uh, they have low empathy, they look at icons rather than abstract ideas, um, they're risk takers much more, um, and uh, they have a fragile sense of who they are. That's one idea, and they're perhaps more aggressive. On the other hand, we could try and create an environment whereby um, people can be encouraged to link a past, a present and a future, to see the importance of consequences, to see themselves as individuals rather than people just hooked into everyone else all the time, so they can actually focus on really stretching themselves as individuals and therefore getting fulfillment in life. Could you give an idea of what such an environment could or should yes. look like? I think an environment, there's no easy answer, should first of all have relatively few distractions. It should be a place where you have time and space to actually put the book down and stare at the wall. Or it's a place where perhaps uh, you are enabled to engage in a creative way. For example, I love flying when I've just got a spare pad of paper where I can just draw on it or write on it. In the old days, a pad didn't ask you to draw on it. You drove the narrative, you, drove, you made up the associations and the connections. So such an environment, you should feel comfortable, you should feel confident, you should feel not threatened, you feel sort of not harried or hustled or worried. It should be a place where you feel comfortable but not too sleepy. So you feel that magic window between being relaxed but stimulated at the same time. What we should all be thinking about much more than we are is the advent of Google Glass, which is a mobile, even more than our phones are mobile, a mobile interface with the cyber world that will be there all the time, where there's a constant readout all the time of what you're doing, where identity is augmented, people's uh, facts and figures are augmented all the time, all these facts flash up in front of you. And I think once we get used to that, it will become compulsive. So it'd be like having a mobile phone with you all the time, but part of your glasses all the time.